Welcome to Bethel. My name is Aaron Adams. I'm the senior pastor here at Bethel, and uh, if today is your first time to visit us, welcome. You picked a great Sunday to visit, and uh, it's a good thing to be together with God's people on a weekend like this one, uh, when we're all still recovering from turkey and stuffing and all of the other good things that this week has held for us. Uh, we've got a few announcements that I'd like to uh, let you know about, and the first of which is, you may have noticed, that we've got a candle lit, which means it's the first Sunday of Advent, which means we're only a few Sundays away from Christmas. It's hard to believe, but it's here. I don't know if you've noticed or not. We did try to keep it subtle, but we made sure that it, there were a few decorations up. And, um, and in light of the fact that we're just a few weeks away from Christmas, we have some Advent devotions that are available for every family. You're welcome to take one. They're in the back of the lobby there. These are the ones that came from our daily bread. So um, we found them and thought, oh, this would be a good one for uh, folks to use if they have the opportunity. So go ahead. Every, everybody uh, can take one home, one per house, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll find uh, God's presence clearly seen in the word and in the reflections in the, in the book. Um, there are a bunch of announcements in your bulletin today, and I'm not going to cover all of them, but please make sure to uh, take it home and look at them and read them and all of that sort of thing. It's got a uh, schedule like all the way through the end of the year and stuff, so, uh, or at least through Christmas. The other things that I wanted to touch on, though, is first of all, there's no youth group tonight, uh, so they'll, they'll meet again um, uh, I believe next Sunday. Uh, but so youth group usually meets at 6 p.m. in the youth house, but 6th through 12th graders take a Sunday to just be with your family tonight, and we'll get back together uh, really, really soon. The second is that uh, we try to do things throughout uh, the year for Jackson Elementary, we mentor children over there through Kids Hope. If you, uh, if you are somebody who really wants to get involved in something with community outreach, um, Kids Hope is an excellent way to serve 
uh, kids who really need a mentor in their lives. I know uh, I have a Kids Hope kid that I meet with, and um, it's a huge blessing to me, but I also know that it's a way that God is using me in our wider community, and there are several others who are doing the same thing. And if you have an interest in mentoring an elementary school kid that is in need, Bill Edwards is the guy to talk to about that. Um, and it's rewarding and it's worth an hour of your time every week. Uh, Jackson Elementary is also, uh, because of the nature of the school, they need, the, their kids need things that a lot of us take for granted. Um, and so we're collecting coats, hats, and gloves for the students again this year. Um, kindergarten through fifth grade, if you have uh, coats, hats, or gloves that you can give, please bring donations to the uh, church office during the next three weeks so that those kids by Christmas will have something. In fact, just when I was there for my Kids Hope meeting with my kid a couple of weeks ago, uh, I heard uh, one of the receptionists calling a parent to say, and I don't know what the kid's name was, Johnny's not going to be able to be in recess because it's too cold outside and he doesn't have any gloves or a coat, but I'm going to try to find them for him in our coat room. But does he have a coat at home? Oh, okay, well, we'll try to find something for him. And so, like, that's the situation that we're in. A lot of kids, they just don't have those things we take for granted. Um, I also wanted to, let's see, I covered the Advent. I did this all out of order. I put numbers out next to them saying, do them in this order, and then I did them differently. Um, but now we're on to uh, members meeting and Christmas meal December 11th after the service, and that's going to include a congregational vote on the 2023 budget. So please plan to participate and be there for that. Uh, it's always an amazing meal when we do the, the meal before Christmas. So, uh, And then uh, the next week we have a lot going on too. It's going to be a busy season because the children's Christmas play is at 9 a.m. on December 18th here in the sanctuary. But that's also the weekend that we're going to have our candidate for our third pastoral position, Crandall Hemphill, out here for his candidating weekend. And there's going to be a lot of events going on so that you can get to know him and see kind of what that's about. And then there will be a short, uh, just a congregational meeting right after that service just to vote on whether or not to bring him on. And then uh, the final thing I've got for you is not in your bulletin, which is this. Um, if you would like to go over and um, see, just view the parsonage in its current state, uh, I'm going to go over there at 12.15 today, and I'll take anybody who wants to go over there with me. Uh, I'm going to see if I can grab a whole bunch of Sharpies, and if you have scripture that you'd like to, as you pray for um, Bethel's ministry in the coming years and the pastors who are going to live in that uh, building over the next several years, and there's a scripture that the Lord has put on your heart, and you would like to mark it on the studs before the drywall goes up and stuff like that, uh, we'll do it. And um, just as a reminder to ourselves that this is, you know, uh, this is how we're praying for um, this particular asset and how it's going to help the gospel moving forward into the many years to come. So uh, 1215 today, if you'd like to walk over there and view it and maybe even, um, you know, write a prayer or scripture on those studs. So uh, last but not least, I'd like to read from Psalm 30. Would you stand with me? This is a psalm of David that was written for the dedication of the temple. In other words, he wrote it, and then he died. And then his son built the temple, and he had this song already ready to go. It says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you've brought up my soul from the grave. You restored me to life from those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O oh Lord, you made the my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. 
What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. He who was before there was light walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing behold from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And at this time, the children are released for Children's Church. Join me as we pray through Isaiah 25. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will extol you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's place is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you, for you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath and the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the strong and ruthless is put down. Lord, we ask that you would fortify your people today, 
Build a wall around your children to defend us from the evil one and the ruthless nations. Strengthen your people and allow us victory over sin and death. Be glorified in your city and in your people here today. May we as a church proclaim your word and give you glory for your salvation. We ask, Lord, your blessing on Chris and Cheryl and the whole country of Haiti, Lord. We ask that you would save that country. Soften the hearts of the government leaders and the organizations causing so much pain and fear in the country. Use the turmoil that they are going through, Lord, to spread your gospel and to draw people near to you. Protect the global outreach compound and provide what they need. Strength, strengthen Chris and Cheryl, Lord. We ask that you would give them rest in your gospel, that you would help the rest of the leaders there, Lord, and give them joy in the work that you have done in their lives and through their work and the work, Lord, that you are continuing to do in that country. We ask your blessing on all the churches here in Greeley and in the Front Range today. We ask that they would be united, that we would be united in your gospel, spreading your good news to a fearful and hopeless world without it. May your message, Lord, be that of hope and of peace and of the reconciling blood of Christ to restore relationships to you. We ask, Lord, that you would be with the struggling, both physically and mentally. May it be a reminder, Lord, that this life isn't our true home that it would be a reminder, Lord, that one day you will make all things right. You will peel back the brokenness, heal the sick, feed the hungry, and drive back the darkness. But while we wait, Lord, we ask that you would fill those who are struggling with comfort. Allow your church to surround them, to carry their burden, or at least help carry their burden. Lord, that your gospel would be active in your church and through your church. Lord, we ask your blessing on this offering. May it be given with a glad heart and may it be used for your glory. We ask, Lord, that you would fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We ask that you would get your glory from our church and the people here today. Let us praise your holy name. Let us give you glory with everything we say, think, and do. We glorify your name and give you great praise for the salvation that you have given us through your Son, Christ Jesus, and it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. This next song is probably unfamiliar to most of you, so... I encourage you to uh, listen the first time through and then join.
Good morning, Bethel family. Let us uh, open in a word of prayer that God would bless this time and uh, would, would, would guide this sermon. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for this day, and thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be able to celebrate Thanksgiving with our friends and with our family, and Lord, for those that are in our congregation that have suffered loss this Thanksgiving or were not able to have the blessing to celebrate with friends and family. Lord, we lift them up to you now, Lord. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would console their hearts now, Lord, with the assurance of your gospel, that you would comfort them with the reality that you sent your Son into the world to be the redemption for their sins, Lord, and that uh, we thank you, Lord, that you are our provider, and you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, and you tell us in your word through your servant David that uh, in all of your days you have never seen the righteous forsaken or go hungry, and though the lions suffer once in hunger, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with the Uskakovic family during this time, and Father, I ask, Lord, that you would guide this message, that you would give us the word that we need to hear today. We ask, Lord, that you would illuminate and open our hearts, Lord, to, uh, to, to, to have the perspective that your word calls us to, Lord, regarding those, those sins which cling, cling so closely that keep us away from fixing our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. I ask, Lord, that you would highlight and expose things that do not reflect you today. I ask, Lord, that as I speak, that your word would go out in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. And I ask, Lord, that you would guide my words and that you would shepherd your people today through your word, that you would feed your sheep. Be with me and empower me for this task today. In Christ's name, amen. Have you ever been to a carnival or a country fair? When I was a kid, I absolutely loved going to the carnival to win prizes of stuffed animals and especially goldfish. <laughs> I always loved being able to grab the ping pong balls and throw them into the bowls and bring home a goldfish that would probably die the next day or the day later. <laughs> but that was, that was one of my favorite things about going to the carnival. Man, they, they had a really elaborate one about 30, 45 minutes away from where I lived growing up in Lexington, Tennessee. Stephen Kennedy knows what I'm talking about. That was, that was the fair to go to in West Tennessee. But another one of my favorite things to do at the carnival was to venture into those funky mirror houses. Do you know what I'm talking about? Think of it as a hall of mirrors if you're unfamiliar with what I'm talking about. Uh, you go in and you see all kinds of distorted images of yourself. You could find mirrors that would make you look fat, make you look skinny, make you look short, tall, and curvy and fuzzy. But as any person knows, these mirrors did not reflect reality. They were a distortion of what your image should actually look like. Today, we'll talk about how Christians are called to image Christ in light of the reality the Bible declares they already are. Let us read Colossians 3, verses 1 through 11 for context. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, 
seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Last week, our senior pastor Aaron Adams preached on the first four verses of this third chapter of Colossians. If you weren't here, there's no need to feel like you can't jump into where we are today in the passage. Let me give you a brief recap. The Apostle Paul, who is writing this letter to a small church in Corinth, is now transitioning from the climax of his letter. He has spent the last several chapters laying the groundwork on how we are to understand the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, while also calling out some false misunderstandings people have regarding the work of Jesus and the life of a believer. Paul has tackled these head on, namely out of care and concern that the pure message of Jesus Christ would not be tainted, nor would these believers be led astray by differing ideologies threatening the integrity of the gospel itself. Paul has reminded this church of who Christ is, what he has accomplished in his crucifixion, what he has accomplished in his burial and resurrection, and what he has procured for us in the ascension. In these first four verses, our union with Christ is at the center of Paul's instruction. We're told that believers in Christ have been raised with Christ to where he is, seated at the right hand of God, in the heavenly places, where the things that are above are, which is probably the heavenly sanctuary where Christ has gone to do his high priestly work to intercede on our behalf and serve in the heavenly sanctuary. Paul urges us to think about what the ascension of Christ means for us that our life is hidden in the heavenly places with Christ and God, and that we are to actively set our mind on such things while we await the sure promise of His return. In light of this heavenly reality, Paul now warns us of the sins that are of the earth and how they tempt us to take our minds off of Christ. Paul is making a contrast here between the things that are heavenly and the things that are earthly. Paul uses an analogy in verse 9 about the image of the Creator to drive home the importance of how Christians ought to conduct themselves in their earthly pilgrimage here, namely to image Christ and what the end goal of sanctification or looking more like Christ is. In other words, how should our union with Christ affect the way we live? Today, I will highlight four ways Paul urges all Christians to image and reflect Christ with their lives. Let us start in verses 5 through 7. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. My first point is, Christians are called to image Christ by conquering sin. If you know the message of Scripture, Jesus conquered our sin by the victorious work He accomplished for us on the cross. And now Christians are called to put to death sin just as Christ put to death our sins. In Hebrews 2, 14 through 16, we read about Jesus. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise partook of the same things, And that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Today is the first Sunday of Advent Sunday. And that word Advent in Latin is actually a word that means coming. And we celebrate the first coming of Christ. And we insert ourselves into the history of the Christian story. Just as the Old Testament saints waited for over 400 years after God spoke the last prophecy through his servant Malachi and through the last two books of the Old Testament, First and Second Chronicles, And they were waiting and longing for the Messiah that would come to set them free from the slavery of sins. And Jesus, now we celebrate in this season that he shared in our flesh and blood and bones and partook of the same things with the same temptations we face. And that through his death, he destroyed the power of death, the devil, and freed us from lifelong slavery to sin. In Romans 6, 6, we're told that our old self was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin would be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to it. 
And in Galatians 5.24, we are told, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In verse 3, we're told that we have died and our life is hidden with Christ and God. And now Paul sets up the contrast to as people that are dead to sin and that are living in Christ, this is the way that you ought to walk. We must feel the way about sin that Christ felt about it. It opposes God, and it must be vanquished. In Romans 8, 7 through 8, we're told, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. But if we have believed in Christ, we are no longer of the flesh, but we are of the Spirit. And we have been grafted in to Christ and his work. In verse 3, we're told that we've already died. Therefore, we're to put to death the following ways of living. Notice that Paul uses this verb here in present tense language. He says to put it to death. He says to actively slay these sins. One thing I absolutely love about this word is there's a rich history of this idea of sanctification, of putting sins to death in the Christian tradition. This is what many theologians have called the mortification of sin. We don't talk like that anymore. We don't use verbs like that anymore. To mortify sin, to put it to death. There was a one a, a theologian, he was the last of the Puritans. His name was John Owen. He wrote this famous book called The Mortification of Sin. And in it, He says, you must never take a day off at putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Always be killing sin or it will always be killing you. And now Paul tells us as living people that have been empowered by the Holy Spirit and empowered by the life of Christ, we are now called to put these things to death, to put to death sexual immorality. The word for sexual immorality is, here is the word porneia. It's where we get the English word for pornography. And this sexual immorality refers to every kind of sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant. And Paul calls Christians to put this sin to death. And that Christians ought not to be living in that sort of way. And now he says, not only put to death the actual immorality that you commit when you sin sexually. But he says to put away impurity. So to put away the impure thoughts that could stir and ruminate in your heart that would lead to impure actions. That you must not only slay the sin itself, but you must slay the idea and the thoughts and not entertain it while it is trying to build a nest in your hair. You must slay impurity and impure thoughts. You must put to death passion. And why does Paul mention the word passion here? What does he mean by passion? He must not mean what our common English language means when we talk about seeing a passionate person or somebody that's passionate for a hobby or those kinds of things, but he is referring to impure desires. As Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 26. You can turn with me there if you would like. In Romans chapter 1, verse 26, we are told, For this reason God gave them up, those that are following their sinful uh, lifestyles, to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion. For one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. This is referring to sexual passion. Paul has not only told us to put to death sexual immorality and impure thoughts, but to put to death the impure desires that would try to consume us, which would lead to an impure thought, which would lead to an impure action. Now, these desires, the desires that Paul mentioned, are sinful. But the desires, the, 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 the desire for sex, 
the desire for being known and being loved by somebody, is not itself intrinsically sinful, but it's sinful when it is channeled toward the wrong thing and outside of the wrong context. It begins to take over that person. I think C.S. Lewis described it best when he described about, uh, he described sex kind of like as a fireplace. Uh, where uh, you go into your living room and the fireplace is built underneath the hearth. And he says that that is the warmest part of the house. And what would normally be dangerous and would consume a house is the thing that friends and family gather around. But when it is taken out of its pure context, it causes a flame that would destroy everything in its path. And that is the nature of sexual sin. It wants to entice you and tell you that it's harmless and that it will give you a warm feeling, but it is actually an impure desire when it is taken out of the context that God covenanted man and woman to be in, in the covenants of marriage. And Paul tells Christians now to slay those impure passions, those impure desires. put to death evil desire what's interesting here is that this is usually the word used to describe lusts and cravings and most of the time it does put to death lust and we ought to put to death lust it can also carry a connotation of any sort of desire this is probably the case here since paul has already mentioned passions and sexual immorality he's not trying to be redundant here when we desire things that are contrary to the will of God, and when we desire harm for another person, he says to put to death evil desires. And he uses the adjective evil to describe desire, because desire can be a good thing unless it is paired with wickedness and evil. And this is the kind of desire that Paul tells us to slay, to put to death. Puts to death covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is the tenth commandment mentioned in Exodus chapter 20. You shall not covet your neighbor or your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's belongings. To covet somebody and to covet their things and to wish their life was like yours is none other than building an idol and an image of a reality that you can imagine that would be better than the current estate that you have. Covetousness is idolatry. It is being discontent with what God has given you as your portion in life. And Paul says to put to death this kind of covetousness. And what's interesting is that this word can also be translated as greediness. And that Paul might also be communicating the idea that sexual immorality is describing impurity, sinful sexual passions, and evil desire, and the person that is committing themselves to this gets greedy for more and more and more and more sexual desire, and they've made an idol out of that sexual sin. Many Bible scholars argue that since these verbs match in case, gender, and number, it could very well be that Paul is stating that all of these are idolatry rather than just covetousness. This would make sense with the rest of the testimony of Scripture where we do see uh, sexual immorality mentioned as idolatry. Go no farther than the Old Testament and you can read about how the children of Israel committed themselves to all sort of sexually immoral practices and made idolatry idols after their sexual immorality. And Paul says in verse 6, he gives us a warning. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. God has promised a day where he will come and judge in wrath of all those who do not trust in him. And as Christians, we once were under his wrath when we walked and lived in our old sinful ways. But now, Christians have been delivered from the day of coming wrath. We're assured this in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. You turn, from God, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. God will not leave sin unpunished 
If he is just, he must exercise his justice. If he does not judge sin, he is not exercising his justice and saying who he claims that he is. In 2 Peter 3, 9 and 11, we're told that the Lord is sparing right now his wrath and sparing that day in hopes that those that would come would repent and would come and believe in the gospel. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowlessness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It will be hasty and it will be quick. It'll be something that takes many people by surprise. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There will be a day that Jesus comes back not only to save those that have trusted in him and who love his appearing, but he will come and will smite those that have not believed in him with, with, with the rod that comes from his mouth. He will come and smite them with the sword. And the, and the fury of God's wrath will be put forward in plain sight for all to see. Since all these things are to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? We, as people that have died to our own sinful passions, our old sinful passions must remember the coming day of God's wrath and warn those that have not believed in him about the threat that God makes and that it's not an empty threat, but it will be one that is sure as the dawn. And as Christians now, we ought not to conduct ourselves in these because Jesus has spared us from that and we were transferred from being under his displeasure and under his wrath into his loving kindness toward us. But God gives the promise and the warning that these things are going to be judged and that the day of God's wrath is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Paul makes a distinction here between being a sinner that is actively walking in sin and living in those sinful ways versus somebody that is struggling with those sins that have died to it and that are now living in Christ. These Christians are called to love what Christ loves and to hate what Christ hates and to slay sin and to slay sin. And we once lived in them and God has redeemed us from that former way of living. We once walked in them and we were enslaved to those desires, but now God has called us to walk in a new way. And now Paul transitions here from those sinful actions now to sins of speech in verses 8 through 9. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. We once were practicers of these kinds of sins and we lived in them every single day. But now Paul tells us to put them off, to put off the sin which clings so closely. We no longer practice these things, but we struggle with these things on this side of eternity. My second point here is Christians are called to image Christ by speaking like Christ. How did Christ speak though? How are we to image Christ with our words? How did Jesus speak? In Luke chapter 4, verse 22, we're told, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. In Isaiah 42, 2 and 3, we're told that the Son of God, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. Jesus would not lift up his voice to make himself heard as the most important person in the room, but he would sustain the bruised reeds. He would not break them, and he would come alongside the faintly burning wicks and strengthen them with his words. 
And in Isaiah 54 through 6, we're told, The Lord has given me the tongue of those who were taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Jesus, when he spoke, he spoke to the weary hearted and he sustained them with his gracious words and lifted them up with the words of life that oozed from his mouth. Morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear as those who were taught. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. The way that Jesus spoke, I challenge you, church, to go read in the gospel accounts all of Jesus' interactions and the way that he spoke with people. With the Pharisees and Sadducees, he spoke firmly and he afflicted the comfortable and their comfortable sins they were living in. But to those that were weary and that were discouraged and that were downcast, he came alongside them and he did not quench those flickering wicks, but he came and he elevated their status before him and spoke the words of life to him and called them to himself to heal their broken hearts. And we as Christians, ought to adopt the kind of language that Christ used when he spoke with other people. We're given this promise in Proverbs twenty-two eleven: He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. When we speak like Jesus, we are told that God is pleased with that as our king, that God is our friend and he comes alongside us in that close friendship when we love the things that he loves and have purity of hearts and when our speech is gracious like Jesus. We are told to speak like Christ and to put away these sins of speech. But now we must ask, you must now put them all away. What is anger? What is wrath? What is malice? What is slander and what is obscene talk? Anger here. This is describing quick-temperedness. This is describing outbursts that come when you face a certain circumstance and you find in your heart comes all sorts of anger and the next thing you know you are speaking out things that you wish that you never would have said as a result of your quick temperedness. In wrath, these outbursts of rage are seething and lasting. These are not quick tempered statements. These are things that ruminate and you actually begin to think about ways that you can act on your wrath and ways that you can act on that rage in ways that you can pay that person back and by saying that thing that you know that will hurt them and that will stay with them. And we're told in James chapter 1, verse 20, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Paul is making a distinction here. He's, he's telling us very clearly about what unrighteous anger is that we ought to put away, but the Bible does say there is a type of righteous anger. Jesus, our Lord Jesus himself, began to be angry when he entered the temple courts and he saw God's law being abused and that people were trying to make a profit off of those in the temple courts and they did not sanctify the temple courts as a place of holiness where God's sacrifices would be and Jesus flipped the tables and made a court of whips. The Bible does tell us not to let the sun go down on our wrath and that we are to be slow to anger. We can adopt a heart of righteous anger and righteous justice like God but more often than not we let our righteous anger become unrighteous. We have to look no further than the life of Moses to be able to see this. Moses was infuriated by the sins of Israel, but he caused other people, he didn't cause, he let other people's sins cause him to act out an unrighteous anger. He saw the idolatry and the complaining that the people of Israel were committing. 
And he goes and he disobeys God's word by striking a rock rather than speaking to it. He lets his anger get the best of him. And God says, I will not let you enter the promised land because you disobeyed my words. I'm sure many parents in this room have felt frustration toward their children time and time again. And you've, you can be a testament to the kind of anger that Paul is describing here. This is something you have to be vigilant towards slaying and putting off. Paul warns fathers not to provoke their children to wrath or to exasperate their children, but to raise them up in the admonition of the Lord. You're not to prod your children and poke them when they're already angry. You're angry and you make them angry and then there's a big conflict of a mess happening in the house. But you are to be gentle in your words with them and their anger. For the proverb says that a gentle answer stirs away wrath. You must be gentle in your admonition and in your instruction and in your discipline with your children. Paul says to put away the quick temperedness and the long anger that stays for days and days. He says to put away malice. What is malice? This is malicious speaking. This is intentionally desiring to speak ill of somebody. This could come out in unwarranted criticism. This could come out in backbiting. This could come out in gossip. And Paul says to put those things away. A lot of times we think that we need to just uh, give, give room for that sin to have an expression in, in a safe place. But we must check our heart when we speak of people and not strip away the image of God that God has created them to be. The author of James tells us that in the tongue lies the power of life and the power of death. And with it, we bless. And with it, with, we curse. And with it, we wound people who are made in the image of God and do not value them the way that God values them when we speak. Even when God is angry with us, He does not speak with us in this kind of way. He speaks with us gently and He speaks with us firmly, but He speaks His truth. Paul says to put away slander and obscene talk from your mouth. What is slander? It's damaging somebody else's reputation. It's going behind that person and stirring up a kerfuffle in the community by trying to intentionally strip down their good reputation that they've built and damage it and disparage it. And Paul says to put away obscene talk. This is interesting because this is the only time this word appears in the New Testament. It, it literally means shameful words. It's filthy and abusive language. It's, 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 it's talk and language that should not be fitting and should never be found on the lips of a Christian. They are shameful words. They're words that come off of the mouth that would be shameful for a Christian to speak and that it is not proper for a Christian to speak in that way. And he says in verse 9, do not lie to one another. It's interesting, this is in the present tense. This could be translated, stop lying to one another as if this is an active problem that is happening in Colossia. And Paul says, stop lying to one another because he's emphasizing the communal nature of this sin. And that when people go and stir up lies and distruths that are causing slander and obscene talk and malicious words coming out of these people's mouths. Paul says that is not the character of Christ and that is not how Christ speaks. And we are to put those away and match the words of Jesus with our life. I have an illustration to share with you. As Yasmin and I were coming back home from Virginia for Thanksgiving, we were riding on uh, this, this, this tram from the airport to the short-term parking, uh, the RTD Airport Railway. As we were riding there, there was a gentleman that was sitting in the uh, front row ahead of us, and there was a man coming to check and make sure that somebody had paid for all of their tickets and that there were no people riding on this train that should not be riding on this train trying to get a free ride without paying for their tickets. 
And this man in front of us, when he sees the gentleman coming to scan the tickets, he acts like he's asleep. He falls asleep in order not to get caught. And not only does he act like he's asleep, but uh, when, the, when the man comes by to uh, check his, his ticket, he taps him on the shoulder and says, sir, sir, to wake him up. And he says, do you have your fare to ride on this train? And uh, the gentleman said, oh, I uh, talked to the lady at the ticket counter and she said I could just hop on, hop off. And he said, there is no ticket counter. <laughs> and uh, sir, that's not how this works. And he called out that dishonesty and made the guy pay for his ticket to ride the remainder of the train ride. And it seemed funny at first that he could just hop on and hop off and get away with that lie. But he was committing an action that Christians are not called to do. He was committing an action that damages the entire community. It damages that man's reputation if he was to let that man get away with, 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 with writing without a ticket. It damages that guy's salary. It damages the whole system if everybody rode on that train without paying. And in a similar way, we're not, we're not, we're not supposed to give room to those cute little small white lies that seem innocent and harmless that actually harm the entire community of the church. And Paul tells us to stop lying to one another because we have put off the old self. This is not the way that you learn to Christ. As a living person, you are to, a living person that is alive in Christ and dead to their sins. You ought to live in a way that demonstrates you've taken off the old and you've stopped practicing those things and you've put on the new. In Romans chapter 13, verse 14, we're told to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the deeds of the flesh to gratify its desires. We're told in Romans chapter 8, if by the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Paul is not saying you must continue to slay sin in order to keep your eternal life. He's saying there's a sort of vitality and life, a joyness in your life that comes as a result of slaying your sins. And God has given you the power of the Holy Spirit to slay those practices because you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've taken off the old garments and put on the new. You're no longer to leave a foothold for sin and to gratify those desires. What's interesting with the language of putting off the old, the taking off the old and putting on the new, Paul might be echoing priestly language here in the Old Testament. Priests are to clothe themselves in order to serve in the Holy of Holies. And as a royal priesthood and a holy nation, we are now priests of God. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 4 and 5, we read, You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with a skillfully woven band of ephod. Leviticus 6, verses 10 and 11. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and put on his linen undergarment under his body and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering in the altar and put them beside the altar. And then he shall take off his garments and put on the other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Leviticus 16, 23, and 24. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. As Christians that are a royal priesthood, a generation of kings and priests. We are to put off the old self and put on the new self so that we can serve God effectively. Just as the priests did in the Old Testament. Which leads me to my third point. Christians image Christ by being renewed in knowledge. Let's read verses 9 through 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. What does it mean to be renewed in knowledge 
after the image of the Creator. This is part of the putting on. We're supposed to take something off and then we're supposed to do something once we've killed sin and slayed sin. We're to put on something else. In Romans 12, 2, we're told, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are to grow in our sanctification by growing in knowledge of God's will and learning who God is. We are called to learn the ways of Christ. The word disciple in Greek is literally a learner, somebody that learns God for, and learns God's ways throughout the rest of their lives. They're not to be conformed to the image of this world, but to be conformed to the image of Christ so that we know what God's will is. We can discern what God's will is from things that are not God's will. We can discern what is good and acceptable and perfect from that that is not good and not acceptable and not perfect for the life of a believer. Paul, in the first chapter in verse 15, said that Christ is the image of God. And now he tells us to be renewed in the image of our Creator, even though men and women are already made in the image of God. So we see in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, in the image of God, he made them, both male and female, he made them in his image. Why is that? Why are Christians called to put on the image of Christ when they're already in the image of God? It's because the image of God was impacted at the fall. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, we're told that when uh, Adam gave, uh, and Eve gave birth to Seth, Seth was made according to Adam's image. Once Adam fell, the whole human race begins to model and image the sins of our original parents. Recall, if you were here during our Ecclesiastes series, when I preached on chapter 3 and verse 18, we read, I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. And Paul, not Paul, uh, the author of Ecclesiastes makes the distinction that Men are like the beasts in a similar way. They're beastly in their disobedience and their lusts and in their conduct. And there's three other passages that note that men are like beasts. In Psalm 73, verse 21 and 22, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. 2 Peter 2.12, false teachers are like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. And in Titus 1.12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. One biblical scholar said, a commentary on Ecclesiastes, the fall brought humans and animals even closer in identity since humanity became less reflective of God's image and more beastly in its lusts and in its conducts. And now Paul tells us to put on the image of Christ. God was passionate about his own image and he came to restore that image by sending his son, the perfect image of God. And that Christians are called to be renewed according to the image of the Savior and image and reflect God more and more throughout the rest of the days of their lives. Which leads me to my last point. Christians image Christ by making Christ their all. Let's read verse 11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. Paul here is now transitioning to the idea that our union with Christ not only should cause us to live a holy life, but it should cause us to be unified with one another. We don't, know, we don't tear down one another and lie to one another, but we are united in the same identity because Christ is in all of us. There is no longer Greek and Jew, meaning there's no longer this social class and this people group that was outside of the promises of God that was not circumcised, and the Jews that had the promises of God and that were circumcised, there's no longer those distinctions to separate them in Christ. There's no longer barbarian and Scythian. Why is Paul mentioning barbarians and Scythians here? It's because the Greeks 
They were the cultured elitists of that day and age, and they made fun of the barbarians who did not have all of their culture and that were brutish, ignorant people. You can see that just even in the name uh, there, bar, 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 because the Greeks would make fun of the barbarians for speaking like that. Bar, 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 nobody could understand what they were saying. They were so uncultured and unsophisticated and simple. And Scythian. Paul makes a contrast here with the Scythian as opposed to the other barbarians because this island north of the Black Sea, they took joy in just killing people for the sake of it. They were the worst of all of the barbarians. But now, Paul says, there is, there is no longer the cultured class and the uncultured class, the circumcised class and the uncircumcised class. There is no longer the class of the slave and the class of the free that would separate you, but you are all one together and Christ is all and in all. This is what the church ought to look like. The church ought not to just look the same. It it should not just look like our immediate family. We should have fellowship over people that are different than us. We are called to bear with one another and be patient with one another and so fulfill the law of Christ. If you read all of the ends of the epistles, you will see at the end that there were owners of horses and slaves worshiping in the same church. They did not have that separation in that social class. When they went to church, those social classes and those segregations did not exist. But what was being imaged there was the promise of the new creation from those of every tribe and tongue and nation and language that have been redeemed by God and that are brought under their one head, Jesus Christ. And they are unified in Christ. And Christ is in all of these people groups because all people in these people groups are being saved. And Christ is in all of them. But I'm left asking a question today. Is Christ your all? Have you abandoned your sinful ways in order to pursue the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Have you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and taken off the old? Are you confident that you will stand safe on the coming day of wrath? You can be confident that you will stand safe on the coming day of wrath. You can be saved as long as today is called today. And you can enter into God's rest. You must repent of these sinful ways. You must repent of them and believe that Jesus Christ has been the perfect sacrifice for your sins. There was no way, no way that you could fulfill these commands perfectly and completely and reach yourself to God in the heavenly places. Our sins separate us from God. Even our good deeds are like a pair of filthy menstrual rags compared to the holiness of God. There's no way we can reach and attain ourselves to God and His ways. We must believe in God's perfect righteousness, that He sent His only Son to do what we cannot do, and that He died for our sins in our place, and Him who knew no sin was made sin for us, and we can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and that when God looks at us, He does not look at us in wrath. He looks at us and calls us friend. He calls us righteous. He calls us holy. He calls us pure, and we are hidden in Christ, and when He sees Christ, He sees us that have believed in Him. You can be confident. You can abandon your sinful ways. You don't have to hold on to that sin anymore. And you can fly to Christ for your healing and for your comfort and life and in death. You no longer have to build a name for yourself because God has declared a name that is more precious than silver and gold could ever buy in those that believe in Jesus Christ. Christ can be your all. You must repent of your sins and believe that he died for your sins and rose from the dead and you will be saved. If you've never done that before, I would invite you to talk with one of your friends, uh, uh, maybe somebody that you came to church with here today, or if this is your first time here before and you've never known the joy of what it is to have life in Christ. Talk with somebody on your way out and they'll be glad to share the good news of Jesus with you. And as we enter into the Advent season and the Christmas season next week, 
we remember that Christ is all and in all. That Christ is the fulfillment of all the promises of God. In 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20, we're told, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes and amen in him. And in Luke 24, verse 44, Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke of thee while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. The whole message of Scripture points to the work of Christ and that He would accomplish. Christ is the answer to all of the promises of God. He is our yes and amen. And He is our all and all. Pray with me. Dear Father, Lord, we, we imperfectly image You, but thank You that our, our ability to image you is not contingent on our own works, but it's contingent on the work of Christ in whom we are hidden in today. And that you, God, when you look at us, you see the precious, perfect, complete works of your Son, and you impart those to us and call us blameless, holy, pure, righteous, innocent, perfect, because of the work of Jesus. And Lord, we want to repent of the ways that we do not reflect that image when we are entrapped to our sins and our sinful passions that cling, cling so closely, Lord. Thank you that there will be a day that death and sin will be no more. But I ask, Lord, that you would help this church be able to put away the old sinful practices and to walk as priests and kings and sons and daughters worthy of the image of God. Because you, Jesus, have made us worthy. And you call us to look more and more like you every single day and to be conformed more into your image. I ask, Lord, that you would help us this holiday season as we go out in public, that we would not be filled with anger and say words that we would regret, Lord, that would, uh, that would, um, that would, that would put shame on the name of Christ, Lord. We want to repent of those times when we have done that, Lord, and just confess that and lay that at your feet, Lord, and say, have mercy on us, Lord Jesus. I ask, Lord, that you would help us be patient with one another. I ask, Lord, that we would be loving toward one another this holiday season, that we would meditate on all the promises of God, that we would remember the work that you accomplished in your coming, and that you freed us from the slavery of our sin, and you destroyed the power of death. I ask, Lord, that we would look forward to the day that we are with you in your coming and that we shall be like you as you are and we shall have a glorified body that will not have any of these hindrances, that will not have any of these earthly passions remaining in its Lord, and that we will have, be set free from the body of sin and death. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have already given us the victory. Would you cause us to be people that would live in that victory every single day as we remember your coming this Advent season. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand as we sing this song of response. The mercy of our God, God has shown to those who sit in death shadow, the sun on high pierced the night, born was the cornerstone. Unto us a child is given, unto us a child is born. He who is mighty has done a great thing, taken on Conquer destiny, shatter the darkness and lift it our shame. Holy is his name. Oh, the freedom our Savior won.
Church family, receive this grace from the Lord. All the law and the Psalms and the prophets have found their fulfillment in Christ, your treasure, your only comfort in life and in death. Go in peace and continue to image Christ to the world as we wait in expectation of the day that we will be perfect with glorified bodies. Go in peace.